Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a podcast produced by the Scientists Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientists and for scientists. Once a month, we will bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. We'd like to thank the sponsor of this month's episode, 10X Genomics. 10X Genomics builds solutions to interrogate biological systems at a resolution and scale that matches the complexity of biology. Their rapidly expanding suite of products, which includes instruments, consumables, and software, enables customers to make fundamental discoveries across multiple research areas, including cancer, immunology, and neuroscience. In this month's episode, we discover how scientists use the principles of evolution to model tumor dynamics and develop new treatment strategies for cancer. Tiffany Garbett from the Scientists' Creative Services team spoke with Robert Gattenby, chairman of the radiology department and co-director of the Center for Excellence for Evolutionary Therapy at the Moffitt Cancer Center to learn more. When we think about evolution, we rarely think about cancer. In fact, we are more likely to think about nature and the outside world. After all, that is how Darwin developed his revolutionary theory of natural selection. In 2008, Robert Gattenby was struck by a new idea for treating metastatic cancer while reading an article about the diamondback moth, a common agricultural pest. Despite every attempt to eradicate it with pesticides, it always adapted. After years of attempts, the government shifted from trying to eradicate the pest to trying to control it. That's been the policy of the United States Agricultural Department since the Nixon administration. So it's a long time. And yet the practice in cancer therapy has for that similar time been always focused on maximum tolerated dose. You know, give the most drug you can, just sort of killing the patient. And from an evolutionary point of view, that's often unwise because what you're doing is maximally selecting for resistance. And when they talk about a cure for cancer, it's, it, the, the implication is that it's a thing. It's, you know, it's a drug or some sort of, you know, magic bullet. And I think that w- what it may be is that it's not a thing, it's a, it's a tactic, it's a, it's a strategy. With that in mind, Gattenby developed a new strategy called adaptive therapy that leverages the evolutionary principles of natural selection, fitness, and adaptation to control metastatic cancer and prolong life. A tumor is comprised of a variety of cell types, including cells that are sensitive to treatment and rare subgroups of cells that are resistant to treatment. Resistant cells use an additional set of molecular machinery to maintain resistance, and this comes at a biological cost to fitness. Within a tumor, cancer cells compete against each other for space and resources. The cells that are sensitive to treatment are more biologically fit, but in the presence of chemotherapy, these sensitive cells die, removing biological constraints for resources and allowing the resistant cells to expand. Resistance is inevitable. Evolution will always uh, start selecting for resistance. But proliferation of the resistant cells is not. And that can be controlled using evolutionary uh, principles. But what, what adaptive therapy simply does is that you give a treatment, uh, you knock down the, the tumor population, so you reduce it by maybe half, and then you stop treatment. So what, what you've done then is you've killed off a lot of sensitive cells. You know that what's left behind are resistant cells, but you intentionally do not kill off all of the sensitive cells. You actually maintain a population. Competition with these remaining cells helps to suppress the expansion of resistant cells. The tumor will return, but it will be comparable to its initial state, dominated primarily with sensitive cells. Physicians then treat the tumor again and thus maintain a steady state of patient survival. In 2014, scientists tested Gattenby's adaptive therapy in a clinical trial for metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Rather than arbitrarily turning the treatment on or off at prescribed times for all patients, as is commonly done in existing intermittent cancer therapies, Gattenby and his team measured the levels of the prostate cancer biomarker prostate-specific antigen PSA, in the blood of patients as an estimate of tumor volume. Then, using evolutionary game theory and mathematical modeling, they predicted the best course of treatment based on the unique evolutionary tumor dynamics of each patient. We view cancer treatment as a game between the oncologist, treating physician, and the cancer. The 
ontologist plays the game. The, a move by the ontologist is to apply a treatment. The cancer then has to play the game by evolving a resistance. So there's strategy and there's counter strategies. But the, the, the ontologist has two major advantages. One is that the oncologist is sentient. The oncologist can anticipate the future. An evolving population can never evolve to something that is not seen. It can only evolve to current conditions. And by being able to control fu- the future treatment, the oncologist has a huge advantage. The other thing is that the oncologist always plays first. It's what's called a Stackelberg game, meaning the, the tumor cannot play its adaptive strategy until the oncologist has actually given a treatment. It's the equivalent of always having the white pieces in chess. You know, you always make the first move. Now, the problem is that the current therapy, which is that you give um, maximum tolerated dose of drug continuously until progression, means that you're basically doing the same thing. The tumor doesn't have to change what it's doing because every treatment is the same. Then the physician changes strategy only when the tumor progresses. So now the tumor is the leader of the game, not the oncologist. And one of the fundamental rules here is we're trying to get the oncologist to use those advantages. And in this case, the on-off represents changes that the tumor cannot anticipate. You then just simply try to maintain the population at a kind of a stable state. And it's, it's oscillating a bit. But as long as you're playing that game, as long as you're, you're oscillating the tumor volume, the patient's alive. And in that time period, about half the time, in fact, it, well, we find it even a little bit more than half of the time, there's no treatment being given. And so the patient's not receiving the, the toxic effects of the treatment or the cost of the treatment. And so uh, the quality of life is maintained. In the 2014 clinical trial, 10 of the 11 patients with prostate cancer maintained stable oscillations of tumor burdens. Prostate cancer patients on standard treatment have a survival rate of approximately 11.1 months. On adaptive therapy, prostate cancer patients survived at least 27 months, more than double the survival rate of the maximum tolerated dose and with less than half the cumulative drug use. No two patients had the same treatment strategy. They required different oscillation cycles depending on their unique tumor dynamics. During this study, Gattenby was surprised to learn that after the initial tumor knockdown, the tumor remained stable without further intervention for quite some time in approximately one-third of the study patients. The tumor actually kind of sits there quietly. It eventually rebounds, but it might take a year and a half before it does. So clearly the body is able to control it without help from the doctors for that period of time. And, um, you know, for the patient, that's great. I mean, they, they just chug on not being treated, really kind of living their lives. So again, that's from a, from a patient quality of life point of view, um, it's good. I mean, they're not getting the, the, the effects of the drug and they're not getting cost of the drug, not being admitted to the hospital or anything. They're really just kind of moving along. Gattenby and his team did not experimentally measure immune cells or biomarkers of immune response during the adaptive therapy pilot trial, but he suspects that shrinking the tumor enabled the immune system to regain control and suppress tumor growth. Understanding this phenomenon will be important for moving beyond maintaining a manageable tumor to eventually eradicating it. Like the immune system is closer. Uh, in baseball, you bring in a closer, which is your relief pitcher for the ninth inning. Uh, that that relief pitcher you bring in to win the game. Every team has one, and we think that the closer will probably be the immune system. To win the game, oncologists need to develop more sophisticated strategies. Ganby suspects that the tumor will eventually adapt to the on and off treatment oscillations. To address this, he and his team are exploring new ways to change the cycle. In prostate cancer, a faster increase in the tumor marker than in testosterone indicates that the tumor is becoming resistant to the treatment. Rather than giving the patient the same drug to decrease the number of sensitive cells, they give the patient a drug targeted specifically to tumor-resistant cells. 
This reduces the resistant population and gives an evolutionary advantage to the sensitive population, briefly allowing that population to expand again and hopefully return the tumor to a treatable state. The discovery that the immune system might play a role in eliminating cancer inspired Ganby. Currently, many researchers and clinicians view metastatic cancer as uncurable. It is widespread and heterogeneous. Repeated assaults on the immune system from the tumor and from the treatment may leave it unable to bounce back. While Gattenby originally focused on turning metastatic cancer into a chronic but manageable disease using evolutionary principles in adaptive therapy, observing stable tumors in his clinical trial challenged that perspective. It indicated that the tumors were not supreme and that the immune system could regain control. Now Gattenby is strategizing new ways to leverage evolutionary principles of extinction. When we think about extinction, we're usually think about the dinosaurs, uh, where, you know, a simple event, a massive application of evolutionary force uh, wipes out a, a species. In some ways, I think the use of maximum tolerated dose, you know, high dose density therapy is, is implicitly kind of modeled on that extinction event. But the problem with it is that it's, it's indiscriminate. So 60% of the land animals on Earth were also killed off that when the asteroid hit the Earth. I really started to, to consider the sort of extinction dynamics that were not associated with dinosaurs, but, but associated with what is now a very large literature in Anthropocene extinctions. The idea that extinctions are not a single cause, single event kind of thing like, like the dinosaurs, but really a sequence of events and multiple different causes that kick in at different times. Anthropocene extinctions are very specific, and they actually involve much subtler uh, evolution dynamics. And those dynamics, I think, can be adapted to treat even widespread metastatic cancers with the goal of, of causing extinction. Gattenby is developing what he calls extinction therapy, which relies on the Anthropocene extinction principle of multiple strikes. In an upcoming clinical trial, Gattenby's team plans to administer androgen deprivation therapy to metastatic prostate cancer patients. They will continue this first treatment until the levels of the prostate cancer biomarker, PSA, decrease enough to indicate a reduction in both the size and cellular heterogeneity of the tumor. Their subsequent strikes will target the remaining cell populations. By changing the drug for each strike, oncologists hope to control the game. A similar multi-strike strategy has previously proved successful in treating childhood acute lymphocytic leukemia. Most people, so when, you, when you say this, go, oh, that makes sense. Um, but, you know, inexplicably, it's just not been dogma. I mean, it, it's always been about a drug to cure a cancer. And so that's been so deeply ingrained, I think, in the medical community that thinking about it otherwise, it's just not been done as far as I know. And so we keep looking for magic bullets and cancer, and, and, and maybe they exist. But in the meantime, I think we can do better with, with the treatments that we have. I've been working in this area for, for decades. I started uh, probably almost 30 years ago, but it's very hard to get oncologists and mathematicians and evolution biologists to talk to each other because they're they're usually, you know, spaced widely, you know, on a campus and the, their language is so different that it takes a long time to kind of get people understanding each other. In 2008, when Gatby was recruited to the Moffitt Cancer Center to head up the radiology department, he had one requirement, that mathematicians also be brought into the center. He wanted mathematicians, oncologists, and evolutionary biologists to work closely together. He believed that evolutionary biologists could help oncologists begin to think about cancer through the lens of evolution, and that mathematicians could help model tumor dynamics to make predictions about the best treatment strategies. After 12 years, this interdisciplinary team speaks the same language. Together, they reframe each cancer case within the context of evolution and use mathematical models to predict the best course of treatment. What we do in that meeting is that we tell the oncologists, they work with a model, but they don't know it. It's in their head. And so what we do is, you know, we coax out of them the model that they have about the sort of treatment, and we begin to frame it mathematically. We actually have a, we have a chalkboard there, and we write down the equations. And as we do that, they see how 
that what we're really doing is not magic. It's just taking what they think and and restating it mathematically. And then as we do that, we start to say things like, well, what, what is this parameter? What, what do you think the value of this is? Or what do you think is going on here? And by that back and forth, they actually then confront questions that they didn't have before. And they typically find it very interesting. And, and they actually enjoy the experience. And, and then what, what will happen is that through those mathematical models, we will do uh, thousands and thousands of simulations to look at various alternatives for treatment, how, what we think will happen given various strategies. And then those are presented to the tumor board. And then the, in the discussions among the physicians, you know, they will use those as part of their thinking. And ultimately, it's the, the oncologist is the chess player. The mathematicians and the evolutionary biologists are coaches. Gatenby's team is exploring the possibility of using adaptive and extinction therapies for other types of cancer, such as lung cancer and ovarian cancer. While Gatenby's work on adaptive therapy has shown promising results, there is still a lot to be learned. The biggest challenge facing adaptive therapy and extinction therapy is a lack of data during treatment. Gatenby and his team are hoping to learn more about what happens within the tumor as therapy progresses. Understanding these mechanisms, as well as better understanding the body's immune response, will be key to developing better treatment strategies to outwit cancer and win the game. I stay up nights thinking about diabolical ways to trick the tumor. <laughs> I mean, once, once you have the game in your head, it becomes very compelling. Other people say the same thing. They start to think about, you know, ways to, to do this. And, you know, as, when the more people that start to, to think about this, the, the more likely, you know, really good new ideas are going to come up. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist and narrated by Tiffany Garbett. We'd like to thank our sponsor, 10X Genomics, for supporting the podcast. Please join us next month as we explore how growing cells in 3D culture provide scientists with new tools for studying complex processes in health and disease. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow Scientists on Facebook and Twitter, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.